grave of Solomon Reek. Among the miserable wreaths of southern Mars, tall ceiling ventured, ready to share his fearless feats with all the world, but hardly ready to share the grave of Solomon Reeve. George Sealing was one of the most personal ghouls you'd ever cared to meet when he disappeared three years ago somewhere in the unexplored wilderness of southern Mars. His loss was mourned not only by the terrain museum of natural history for whom he worked, but by a multitude of lovers of adventure by proxy, as well as though as well who kept up with his astounding fortunes through their daily papers. For George Sealing was who feared nothing had walked, called, flew, or pulsed, who owned, moreover, a shiny pair of seven-league boots in the form of its sort of all expense account, believed in sharing himself with the public. He adored publicity. There was the time, for instance, he made off with the crown jewels of Tazan Princess Gilamede. People loved it, all of them excepting, of course, the Kinemelians. They were considerably upset. Being a minority group, there was not much they could do once Sealing had escaped with the jewels. Then there was a celebrated occasion of his robbing the grips of Neymar, Neymar, a moon goddess of Olu. From Lou, he swiped several golden oil oils of inestimable value, which was just as well, for they were not doing the natives the least bit of good, despite their complaints. It almost caused an international incident. Museum kitten treasure and procurer collected a fat commission. This is, as one can readily see, demonstrates graphically that George Seeming Sealing felt almost as much at home in tombs as he did in the public eye. The south of Mars is a ragged land of Naked red peaks of deep, impassable canyons, a reed pit filled swamplands, and barren plateaus. The people who live there are primitive and thin as greyhounds, but a shy, gentle nature, with huge, dark, melting eyes, to set deep, leathery, pale, pillage skin, and nervous, spray bare feet, and pad the sands of uplands at incredible speed. To George Sealing, the gills were merely an incredible. Incidental oppression to add to the mirage of weird people from many worlds already suffered his brain. Suffered his brain made him rather constipulatory with regard to alien creatures, cultures. He had already spent several weeks on Mars, almost all of it in Paphrovienna, chief spaceport of southern Mars, where he haunted the bars, native district, asking, seeking, wheedling, bribing, so he found what he sought, a man who could lead him to one of the old cities, and they hid him back in the hills. So it came about that he landed himself as guide to rented chopper of a certain uncharted mountainside on the southwest of Pophenia. There the field glasses, magarets of the city, were just visible. But it's impossible to get any closer, for there's no place to land. The old Martians have been averse to flat roofs, a curse of circumstance, and they're sterling to doubt audibly they could have had the sense that they couldn't have had a sense of an adult eel. After landing himself down with paraphernalia that as explorers are supposed to carry, he went on alone. The guide was kindly an invitation to accompany him. It's almost dark when he stumbled for the first bit of masonry, some prehistoric curbstone, perhaps. He walked for hours in a tangled feather, but for a second, so giant reed, the suddenness of his discovery startled him. He had wandered right in the midst of the abandoned city without even knowing it. Such is the customary luck of George Sealing. He could see shadowy outlines of some eroding old towers from where he stood, but he knew it was too late in the evening to explore them safely. He had waited his time this long. He wouldn't hurt, wouldn't hurt to wait through one other more short Martian night. He found a clearing near the Glufus Comula Towers spread his sleeping bag beneath its wall. He went to sleep elevated with his good fortune and slept dreamlessly without disturbance. But then he took a great deal to disturb Joel Sealing when he slept.
In the morning, the gills were there. There were about a dozen of them, silently squatting in a semicircle, but his camp contemplating him at a respect, respectful distance with his soulful gazelle eyes. There's something discurting, discontenting about waking up, finding that one who's quiet and uninvited guests, but ceiling never turned a hair. He reached over and grabbed his rifle, but the gills never moved. They looked all the world like purple-brown graven images. Squatting there, except the round blow, black eyes blinked once in a while. The gill tongue was a rather rheumatic one. A ceiling was naturally adapted at such things, had studied at some length during the weeks of Paphonia. He felt he could get along. I greet you, he said, still thundering his rifle. I am Earthman. We know, one of the girls said in a curious whistling voice. What do you want here? I want to see the city, George said. This is a sacred dead city of solemn rage. A wisest of all ancient ones. We do not welcome visitors here. I it's not your city, damn it, George said. What did you say? Sorry. I said it's not your, uh, not the work of your race. Why do you care if I look around? It's a shrine that our ones looked, took care of us before. It went away. We loved them. I do not want their dead disturbed. George then grinned with delight. He never enjoyed himself so much as when the, the, he was where he wasn't supposed to be. I would be very, it would be very sad if the dead were desiccated. The girl said, Hmm, said Stelling imprudently. But what would you do if I went ahead and desecrated them anyway? Head Gill looked shot. He turned his saucer eyes on his companions. They all squirmed in their haunches. Looked shot too. We would be very sad, the Gill answered. No hard feelings, George said, he said. But if the advancement of science, the proposal of knowledge, had left it up to you fellows, the world would be a hell of a fix. He aimed his wife for suggestion to the Gill's chest. Do you know what this is, what I'm pointing at you? It's a death stick. We've seen them before. Right now, there's something you can't do for me. Right now, there's something you can do for me. I'll take it very kindly if you cooperate. Kindness is sometimes we understand. That's fine. Somewhere about here are tombs of the old race. All the legends of Mars tell about the wealth of the ancients. Here this Solomon Rig was sort of a Martian king. Tut. Leave me there, and I'll be kind enough to spare your life. The girls all blinked their eyes rapidly, seeing the fancied there would be tears in their eyes, a set of deals. I have no tear guardians. He felt a little sorry for them. Come with us, the leader said. The girls said. Stealing was probably impressed. He in seen enough of the old cultures of the planet to realise that here indeed was something special. The walls loomed up high above his head, shutting out the light of the morning sun. As he walked down the street, canyons where the, ve- where the vegetation had not yet penetrated. The gills padded on ahead of him. There's a musty smell about the place. Most appropriate, the old timers had quite a flair for the antique. He thought the masonry was a kind of cemented substance with lilies hard as granite. The weather had eroded into it into lovely pearly greyness that was stately smooth to the touch. He stroked the walls lovingly and wished he could transport the whole place back to earth. At the end of one street, a bright yellow curl snake struck at him and he killed it with a butt of his rifle. They encountered no other life. Everywhere there was silence. The gills made several turns through narrow passageways, and all at once seeing a face to face the most breathtaking sight he ever beheld. In a great hidden courtyard, a palace lay. It was at least six hundred feet high, with a massive base of the delicate multiple pinnacles, a forest through stone, the arched floor roof, a sard was inscribed with countless lacy designs, set to mother masonry with snowy white stones. A great arched doorway gaped open violently to the kind of darkness stealing found most exciting. 
The girl stopped. You are certain that you will not change your mind? Look here, Staling said. I come here to collect artifacts or, or, or anything I can lay my hands on for my people on Earth. If I don't bring something good back, they send others who won't be as patient as, with you as I am. This is sad indeed for the radiance. A major still lingers in the castle, said the girl. He's not going to hurt his radiant messenger, whatever he is, Sunny said. What I want is junk, stuff that you never use anywhere. So let's get on with it. George Stanley was panting by the time he climbed top of the central tower. He'd always thought of a tomb as some damp, dark hole beneath the surface of the ground, for such has been experienced many times before. But the resting place of Solon Ridge was wise as a large, light room, not half as eerie, the big throne room below, for instance. It took him seven minutes to work the mechanism at the door. When he got it open, he went in and found a convenient coffin to sit on. Wiped the sweat from his forehead and indulged in a cigarette before continuing. The room had no windows. There was no. There was light coming from a great transparent dome of roof. A cheerful place, he thought, for a crypt. There were six coffins in the room, neatly arranged around its preparatory. He wondered which one was Solon Reed's. While the briars was plain, untarnished metal, a silver alloy he didn't and couldn't quite identify. Upon one of them was a modest crest, a symbol, and one he decided must be the coffin of Solar Rage. He feeling a bit little ill, a headache for the attitude, he thought, or perhaps he called a touch of the fever. Better get it over and with and get out of here. Mm. All the pleasure of discovery was gone now. He could, could Look, took out his array of chisels, went to work on the coffin, which yielded easily to his professional looter's touch. Lid was light and slid, almost aside and soundlessly. Joy Sennian came face to face with Solon Rage, a relic of Rage, a wise, seemed to be in perfect condition. Above all lay his semi-transparent clothing of waxy substance, preferred pre- servants, I suppose, he supposed. Figures as large as his own. The old race must have been much closer genetically, his own and the gills. But Sterling was not concerned with any of this. He flopped Sterling Reed over his belly without summary and examined the bottom of the coffin. It was no use. No treasure here. there. He did not find something, however. A ring of Sterling Reed's finger. He chipped off the preservative, slid the ring off and put it in his pocket. Then he examined the other coffins. Wise, perhaps, the dignitaries of court that they had been. They all, they were both male and female, but no jury. He searched the room carefully, but there was nothing to be found. It had been done, it had been done their custom then, to bury the treasures of the dead, or perhaps the gills had taken it. No matter, he knew the fertility of looking further. Well, the race chose to hide his treasure, rather than try to take them along for how long to the happy hunting grounds. They usually did a good job. He remembers searching in vain for the whole solid year. Catagones and Neptune once. His face was burning of some inner fire now. He knew he must have a high fever. He felt much worse. But to go back empty-handed, and suddenly he knew that he would not. He took the steps back down to the throne room. For he had time, for he felt strangely, must hurry. The gills are still waiting for him there. In the gloom, they seem to be more of them now. He could count... Bother the count. I want eight of you, he said. You are, are some of me to the crypts. I'm going and taking the coffin of Solo Reed. Back with me. You're going to carry it. I don't want any arguments. I'll pay you whatever you want. But it, it's got to be done right away. They were not a strong brace of regales, their box was at handles. But finally they got to their shoulders, twice coming down the spiraling staircase. He slipped, he cursed them furiously. Then he was amazed he could he could do what that they he could do. Be so distraught. They carried it down the front room and set it down, the big rotunda full of gills by this time, hundreds of them. What the hell is this, George Sonny said. His voice sounded thickened to him. 
If you're going to start trouble, I'll kill the first deal. Killed it lands a hand on me the coffin. He waited for an answer. There was not a sound. But in the dark multitude of gills, they watched him soberly. Well, ceiling mellowed the gill, who talked with him before, said, You gather here for a telling. Will you crouch here and hear us? I don't know what you're talking about. Please hear us. Dean looked around him. Better not to decotize them. At that, he supposed, since it seemed they had no intentions, a present of being doing something dr- anything drastic he waited long ago the gill said there was the, there were the old ones. They were as guards. The new great magic all was happiness, but the magic was not great enough. One day there came invaders beyond the stars and sprayed the cities. A green fire that was so light it touched could not be felt, yet it killed in great numbers. The rest it changed. Sullen Reed, who was wise, took his family about him and laid in a tower but between it behind air to doors a green fire could not come many weeks he stayed there of an air purifier to keep out the radiance and he felt left in fresh air I felt left the enemy left and at last the enemy left Burns were le- left a charge more and more but they even so that even their heads they were affected they could scarcely take care of themselves so let me from behind his closed doors, where the pure eye was sorrowed for us. Cursed us to pick our lives as best as we could. He did not dare come out because the radiance did not leave, but hung about the place. Uh, palace. He did not care anymore. He knew the radiance, which would always be there, but he could not, would, could not hurt us now. So let me and his family did all they could for us and remind, remembered all the wonderful knowledge we have forgotten. They tried to teach us, but we have forgotten how to learn too. We, we, George said in screen. What are you talking about? We gills. Do you not understand? We are the old ones. Oh, God, George said. The radiance is still the building, the buildings. That is what we tried to tell you before. We're too late now. It has, it has touched you. Let me out of here, here. Selling him stopped. I won't be changed by any damn radiation. I'll go back to Earth. They'll help me. They know what to do. Help, they'll help me, damn it. You will not go back, the girl said. I'm sorry, but you cannot go back like this. You'll be more at home here from now on. All the girls looked at George Steady with sad, limpid eyes. They were silent. There wasn't any more to say, be said. Nothing they could think of. George Steady squatted there, glazed back at them with big saucer eyes.